This is going to be a five-part series on how to build a chicken coop. Part one focuses on design features you would want to consider building into your coop when you go to construct it. Part two is how to build the framework in the structure of the coop itself. Part three details how to stretch chicken wire over the post of your coop. Part four details how to build an automatic watering system. And part five details how to build a nesting box with a rollout for egg eating chickens. Let's get started with part two how to build the framework of your chicken coop. We've had chickens for about 15 years, and when we first got started with chickens, we designed our coops, and then after a few years went by, I learned of different things that worked well, and other things that didn't work so well. So in this coop, I'm gonna tell you the advantages and disadvantages of different designs. We also chose a design that was very open compared to a solid wall coop, so that way air can flow through it and kind of keep more sanitary conditions. For you should always build your chicken coop with a dirt floor. I've seen some people that built chicken coops on concrete slabs or even on plywood substructures, which both of which are not a good idea. Chickens like to scratch the ground. They love looking for bugs and other things in the dirt. So definitely do a dirt floor. It's a lot cheaper to build and a lot easier to keep clean. Your predators will get in in one of several ways. Either they're going to dig underneath the walls of your coop or they'll come through the chicken wire or possibly some crack or crevice that is not sealed up. In this video, we're going to show you how to make a coop that will withstand all these possibilities. Let's get started first with building the structure of the coop. To lay out the foundation for your chicken coop, go out and place some stakes on four different corners of your coop, following the dimensions that you want to do. Do a diagonal measurement from this diagonal corner to this one, and it should be the same from this diagonal corner to this diagonal corner. If the diagonal measurements are not the same, then likely what you've done is you've laid out your coop in a parallelogram. If your cross measurements aren't the same, then just simply take one side of it and shift the poles one direction or the other until you get your measurements exactly the same. Next, go ahead and install the post on all four corners using a level to make sure they're perfectly straight up and down. And then go pull a string across between the two posts. And the idea being with the string that these posts will be exactly in line. Pull your string and get these posts exactly in line and use a level to get them all nice and leveled up, facing these posts about four feet apart roughly. You want to take note of how wide the nesting box is going to be so that you can space these posts appropriately so that the nesting box can attach to them. And the end cap on our nesting box was just a little bit wider than what the individual box dividers were so that we can put a bolt right through the post that holds up the structure of the chicken coop. On the front of the coop, you want to space this post as wide as what you want to make the door. Once you have all these posts in the ground, they're all level and nicely straight. Now it's time to begin on the framework of the building. You're just basically going to line up a row of 4x4s. Four four we did use some of these yard timbers initially. I wouldn't recommend it though. They don't have as good a pressure treating as what your 4x4 four four posts do. So you probably need about a 10 foot post, you know, in your front corner. And as we went back, we got down to about maybe five and a half foot tall in the rear. So you could have like an eight foot pressure treated post there. So on this one, for a span of about 12 feet, we have basically four posts in a row. And then there's a two by six that runs down the length of it there. You put three eighths bolts through your post into this two by six. Then we ran stringers across, which are two by sixes, which span about eight foot. We just screw the two by six stringers right down onto the beam that goes across. If you're worried about hurricanes, tornadoes, or windstorms, then you can always use these hurricane clips on each of the stringers that you put on top of your main stringers. And after all the stringers were in place, we basically used some galvanized metal roofing and screwed it down to the top of the stringers. Here's an example of one of the screws we used to screw the metal down to the stringers. It has a rubber washer just under the head of the screw, which gives it a watertight seal down to the deck. Then we came back and used some spray foam to fill all the gaps, and that way the snakes can't get in. Hey, we'll be back in a little over 60 seconds, and we're going to pause real quick to see if you need any eternal repair. You might say, eternal repair? What's that? Well, hey, consider your whole life, and all your life, have you ever told a lie before? I have, and I'm sure you have too. We all have. Also consider, have you ever stolen something, even no matter how small it was? I'm sure you have, and I have too. The whole point of where I'm going with this is those two rules, lying and stealing, those are two of the Ten Commandments in the Bible, for which define what sin is. So if you've broken even one of those rules, no matter how small it was, that means you've sinned, and we all have. The punishment for sin is going to hell, or eternal separation from God. The good news is Jesus Christ came to this earth. He didn't lie. He didn't steal. He didn't do all these crazy stuff that you and I have done. He was totally without sin. He was sacrificed on the cross for my personal sin and yours. He went to the grave. Three days later, he defeated death, and now he sits beside the Father in heaven. The whole point of why he had to take that punishment on the cross was he was taking the punishment for your sin and for my sin. 
but it can only be accounted to you if through faith you believe in who he was, what he did, you submit to him as your Lord, and you repent. And when you do that, you can have eternal habitation with Jesus and the rest of the saints for eternity in heaven. You might be saying to yourself, hey, I'm a good person. Surely God wouldn't send me to hell for all the nice things I've done for people. But the truth of the matter is the Bible says, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man or woman should boast. There is no amount of good work you can do to earn your righteousness before God. Only faith and trust in what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Hey, let's get back to our video, and I'll have a little more information on the eternal portion of this at the end of the video. I want to show you a quick explanation of how we did our exterior perimeter. Suppose that this is a 4x4 post. Here's another 4x4 post. Here's the chicken wire strung across the outside of the coop, and the corner turns right here. This is a nesting box, and this is the ground level that you're building your coop on. What we did is we went and we dug a trench around the perimeter that went down about maybe about 10, 12 inches. We did it with a pickaxe, so this is only about maybe two inches wide. And we took metal objects and we nailed them into the bottom of the trench with the head sticking up below the bottom of the trench. And then we came and we backfilled this with concrete right in here so that the concrete fused around the metal objects that were sticking down in the ground. In our earlier versions, we just put it right in the bottom of the trench, then we backfilled it with dirt. And later we decided we wanted to put this concrete all the way up to above the grade just a little bit because we had some issues with the wire would rust out right at the ground line. Here's a spot on this one where the wire was right down on the dirt and it actually rusted the bottom off. And, you know, a predator was able to get underneath it. By adding a little extra concrete and bringing it up about two or three inches above grade, you know, we were able to alleviate this rust out right at the ground level. In this next footage, I'll show you exactly how we were doing it. Okay, we're going back through on this old coop and we're putting the concrete down below grade level on our half inch hard on our half inch hardware cloth we've got a trench here that's dug about you know almost 12 inches down it goes down just a tiny bit down below the bottom of the hardware cloth and we have all kinds of obstacles that we're nailing now down to the bottom of our trench here's an old tent stake our tent pole here's an old tent pole here's a broken part of a golf club here's a piece of metal from a shelving unit we're also taking some three and a quarter inch nails and we're just pushing them down to the bottom of the trench with the heads still sticking up a little bit so that the concrete will come and seal around the top of the heads of the nails. Now we're going to backfill the trench with wet concrete. And this is going to seal in all of these items that we've nailed down to the ground. I'm putting a piece of wood behind this thing so I can kind of keep my cement layer kind of thin and I can bring it all the way up to the top of the grade. And then we bring the concrete just a couple inches up above grade. We use the one inch chicken wire, which turned out not to be such a good idea. The chicken wire that came from Lowe's and Home Depot was pretty good quality and it lasted maybe six, seven years. The chicken wire we got from Tractor Supply was junk. And this is basically what you end up with after about two or three years. It just literally just falls apart, you know, from just rust. One of the disadvantages to this one is chicken wire. We've actually seen egg-eating snakes pass right through this wire where their bodies were almost twice as big as the holes in the wire. However, as they go through, their body will contract and they can pass right through it. This half-inch galvanized wire cloth, which that has held up pretty well. This coop is about 12 years old and all of the half-inch galvanized wire is still in good shape where the chicken wire is just basically disintegrated. Here's the product that we're replacing the one inch chicken wire with. It's a half inch, 19 gauge hardware cloth. You might say when you go price it, you go, oh, that's too expensive. A lot of labor went into putting this junk on the side of our coop when it only lasted between two and six years based on the different manufacturers. So I only wish that I went and spent the extra money and did it right the first time. On our first design of this, we actually used a chain link fence gate you know, to be the door to open and shut accessing the chicken coop. And when we found this did not work very well, we actually had a bobcat that was actually able to stick his arm through the chain link fence and grab the first chicken in the box right there on the corner. And of course we had a lot of problems with corn snakes and whatnot going in and eating eggs. The design we then moved to was to actually make a door out of wood and use this half inch hardware cloth, you know, as a screening on it. When we constructed these doors, they're made out of two by fours. We took some of our scrap pressure treated plywood and made some corner brackets for them. So that way it screwed this whole thing together and made it nice and sturdy. It actually has a, a hasp on it. And when that hasp is all attached, then it's all nicely sealed up so that snakes and whatnot can't get in and get to your eggs. 
The design of this coupe was actually a double coupe, so it's about 12 feet deep and about 16 feet wide. And we actually had a divider wall that goes right down the middle with an access panel that we could remove, you know, in and out. And in some situations, we let all the chickens run together. If we had to quarantine a chicken, if we had a chicken that was getting beat up too bad by the others, we could put the door back in and then we could have somebody on one side that needed to have a little bit of recovery. Or if we had two groups in general, we could just keep them separate. Hey, as far as the eternal portion I was talking about, if you're not sure you know who God is, I encourage you to just to pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, if you were real and you were out there, I pray you would reveal yourself to me in a tangible way. And when you make that prayer, he's going to answer it and you will know he is real. At the point you know he is real and you're ready to accept him as your Lord and Savior, the gospel is so simple. All you have to do is just pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are the Son of God. You took the price for my personal sin on the cross. I surrender my will to your will as Lord of my life. I repent of my sin. Thank you for loving me, forgiving me, and accepting me into your eternal habitation. That's just how simple it is. But the catch is that just saying those words won't do anything for you, only unless the heart believes the words that you're speaking. For the Bible says in Romans 10:9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord, which I just did, and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation only comes through faith and believing. Hey, if you get a chance, visit our website, eternalrepair.com, where we have a lot more information about your walk with Jesus Christ. That's eternalrepair.com. Thanks for watching.